Hey, I'm Luke Gerges. And I'm Poppy Reed. And you're listening to Fear at the Top. Few people have their finger on the pulse in the Australian startup scene, like founding partner of Flying Fox Ventures, Rachel Newman. Flying Fox have invested in music and entertainment startups like Cusick, Surreal, formerly known as Muso, and Mr. Yum, who are in almost every live music venue, every any place with a meal around the country. And Rachel herself was instrumental in Eventbrite's launch in Australia. Australia is becoming a bit of a unicorn factory, and Rachel herself has invested in nearly 200 companies. If you're an Australian founder, Rachel is someone you need to know. Rachel, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for coming on the podcast. So we have a lot of guests on here that are tied to the music industry or very much in the music industry. You've invested in music companies, you are a VC and a massive music fan, right? I'd love to start with that journey. Yeah, that's right. So um, it actually will take us down memory lane. Back when I was a kid, I was a massive music fan. Most of my teenage memories are me like on the floor of my bedroom with my stacks of CDs. You guys remember what CDs are? Right? Yes. That's how I impress girls as yeah. a kid. Look at all my CDs. <laughs> but like with my liner notes out, like reading word for word, and my best friend and I. Um, Which is Natalie Portman, by the way. I, could, I, I want to make that all like, right. assertion. Small name drop. But yeah, <laughs> Natalie and I are massive music fans, and we spent most of our youth – Um, sneaking out of the house, going into Manhattan to see shows. Now, we were actually good girls. Like, we didn't do anything bad, um, but we were definitely sneaking into clubs anywhere where there was live music. We were obsessed with all the kind of girl rockers back then, Juliana Hatfield, Liz Fair, Fiona Apple. Um, If they were playing in the city, we were at their show. Um, And so, yeah, always a massive music fan personally. Um, One of my first jobs out of high school was working for one of my favorite artists, Ani DeFranco, which ages me, of course, Uh, and then have always found a way to somehow incorporate music in what I'm doing. And now as a VC, I wish I had an opportunity to do more, but where I see opportunities where software can serve either the music industry or popular culture, um, not only is there that a space that I know and love, but there's a huge commercial opportunity as well. So mm. always looking for those opportunities. And you wanted to start a music label, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> this is where it's super embarrassing. But um, yeah, when I was, you know, 14, 15, first of all, Natalie and I always joked that we had a band. The band had a name. It had a logo. We even designed a CD. Neither of us could play a damn instrument. Not that that mattered, but uh, we had the look. Actually, for my 15th birthday, she bought me a guitar strap. Um, and it was a company called Built by Wendy. And she made super bespoke guitar straps. She made one for Michael Stipe and Rachel Newman and a few others. I did not know how to play a guitar. Did you I, have a guitar? I had to go and buy a secondhand guitar to go with the strap. Uh <laughs> Yeah, so I wanted to, I always thought when I was a grown-up, I'd have a record label. It had a name. It was called Homespun Records. It had a logo. Great name. And um, I was silk screening t-shirts at, uh, in school at the time, and so I even made my own swag. So it's funny you said you wanted to start a record company when you were younger. You you obviously know Jad and Comerford quite well. Mm. Um, you know, he's music industry record guy who also is now into VC. And him and I were talking about how similar being a VC and running a record company are. And I don't know if you under, if you are aware of that analogy, but I mean, just if you think about a record company, A&R person, they're out there trying to find talent, VCs, yep. out there trying to find founders and talent. You make bets on them, hoping that their promise turns into a realization of that potential. It's what VCs do with founders. Yeah, You have a pot of money, you deploy the pot of money, you invest in it, and you try to get outsized returns on the minority of bets you do. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. That last point especially is that um, both industries are hits businesses and so you require quite a bit of at-bats until you get that superstar, that blockbuster. Now, each investment that you're making or each artist that you're backing, you have the high conviction and the belief and the hope that each one is going to be Beyonce, but you know that chances are just one or two percent of those will come true. Um, So yeah, I actually hadn't thought about the connections until now, but I guess like it's very clear and it's not surprising that I'm in a business that looks and feels like the music industry. Maybe you need a Flying Fox imprint called Homespun. (laughs) Oh, that's amazing. I had not even thought about... uh, Don't waste that name. I should diversify. Actually, back then you couldn't just like go on Google and do an IP search, but I... 
I like went through like microfiche or I don't know what shit I was looking at, but I found out that someone had a company called Homespun Records. Mm. They were in upstate New York and it was instructional tape cassettes on like how to do homesteading things. And I was so bummed because <laughs> what? Like, it was squashing my dream. So I told myself like when I'm ready to launch the record label, like I'll buy it out or I'll sue them or I don't know, something <laughs> like that. I was a New Yorker, so I was getting aggressive. I was also 15. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> a lot I, of I, angst. I, luckily I didn't have to take on that legal battle. My <laughs> career went in other directions instead. It did. So I want to hear about Flying Fox. I, I mean, tell me about the fund. How big is it? What's your average check size? How big is your team? Yep. Everything. Cool. So Flying Fox Ventures, we're an early stage venture firm that – invests in Australia and New Zealand's most uh, exciting and promising founders and the businesses that they're building. So to date, we have 54 companies that we've backed. We like to be that first money in, not the kind of family and friends money, but the first institutional money that comes in. So our average check size in the first instance is anywhere from like 250 to five fifty, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000. And then as we are building up our new fund, which I'll talk about in a second, that's where we want to follow on with checks in the order of magnitude of a million, two million. We believe that at the early stage, there are two really important things for return. One is having lots of at-bats because as I mentioned, this is a hits business. You need to create the conditions that you're most likely to have outsized returns. So for us, that's having a large portfolio. So 54 companies now, we're just gonna keep getting bigger and bigger. And the second is diversification. So we believe that in Australia, we're not ready to pick winners in certain industries. We also are watching what's happening from a macroeconomic perspective, and we want diversification to protect against, you know, one industry being disproportionately impacted. So that just means that we invest across all industries, but what is in common is a heavy emphasis on B2B SaaS companies. So that's a little bit how we operate. We're small but mighty. Um, even though we focus on Australian and New Zealand founders, those founders are building businesses that are global and ideally global from day one. And B2B SaaS quickly is? Yeah, so that's just software companies where your customer is a business. Um, and so we love those companies because they tend to be capital efficient. So it means a little bit of money goes a long way. It means that very often there is a sales cycle that is advantageous to being here in Australia. So you don't necessarily need to be on the ground in the markets that you want to serve, like the U.S. or the U.K. And it's also what we know. So my uh, partners, Kylie Fraser and Bree Kirkham, we know B2B SaaS. So with our ability to help these companies grow, it makes sense that we're investing in a model that we've seen over and over and over again. When did you bring Brie into the fold? Because, you know, I've, I've heard about Kylie and Kylie Fraser and how you two came together. And I, I would love to know the origin story of you bringing. Our thruple. Two, yeah, the, yeah. The, this powerful th all-female thruple. I love that. Was yeah. it really just a case of trying to combine strengths and buying power? Like what, what was the thinking? Yeah. So, I mean, it's just as you grow and scale, you need to bring um, more hands on deck, but also, like you said, another skill set that complements our offering for our founders. And so Bree joined the firm earlier this year. Um, she has an incredible background. Uh, she had worked at Airbnb and Uber and then ClassPass and helped them grow and scale. And so just great operational experience. And so if we think about what do our founders need, I just mentioned we want them to be global from day one. So we want them to be able to enter new markets, grow and scale quickly. And those lessons that Brie has learned from being on the operations side of that growth journey is invaluable for those founders. Kylie is an M&A lawyer and a founder herself. I came from an, operator, an operations background, both customer operations and product. And so we're trying to just continue to build this kind of um, you know, skill set that's complementary so that we're giving our companies the best chance of success and therefore our investors the best chance of outsized returns. Mm. And the, the tech founder world is largely male dominated. Were you like, amazing, two other powerful women, let's do this. Was that a conscious decision or was it just like, well, these are people I greatly respect and I want to work with them? Yeah. So I think that great women just find great women. And if you believe that talent is equally distributed, uh, it would be equally found in men and women. Just sometimes, whether it's around bias or network, you just don't have access to those amazing women. So that's kind of like our unfair advantage. Uh, so we happen to be a firm that is 
completely led by women. That is not by design. We happen to be a firm where over a third of our capital has been invested in founders that are female. That is not by design, but just I think great women find great women. Uh, folks that are maybe overlooked and under um, underestimated by others, we can kind of see through that a bit more. So there's so much that can be said and that needs to be fixed on the gender discrepancy in our industry. But right now, that's our unfair advantage. Mm. Oh, I love that. That's very cool. And you're making a lot of investments, 10 to 15 a year. Uh, you're looking at over a thousand companies during that time. That is a lot of work. I am a, retired. A lot of, <laughs> I would be retired too. Um, I'm interested to know what are like, what makes you green light a company that you then invest in? Like, um, and to use a bit of a dating term, what are the green flags that you're like, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I just recently learned about beige flags. Oh, I what are know. they? I only know orange and green and red. Yeah, no, there's what? this whole beige thing, which is like, yeah, it's a dating thing. I mean, I've been married for 15 years, so I'm not up to date on the dating world. But, is it neutral? Uh, like, uh, take it or leave it? No, it's like random things. I don't know. I obviously don't know. But we'll find, you know, <laughs> yeah. we'll see what the kids I'll are Google talking about these days. Yeah. I'll Google Bumble beige flags exactly. and see what comes up. All right, I'll tell you about my <laughs> green flags, and I'll tell you about some red flags as well. I talk about... Our So first of all, you just have to fit within our thesis, right? So like, um, are you, I'll start with, we are looking for founders who are able to articulate the customer problem in an incredibly clear and concise way. And so that's not them explaining to me their technology or their business idea or their service. That's articulating the customer problem. Now, ideally, that customer problem is in a large and growing global market. We call that the TAM, the total addressable market. And there is something that is happening in the conditions today that is making this an unprecedented opportunity to be solving that problem in this market. And then the founders themselves, and usually it's one or two, sometimes three, I have one company that's four, but that's an exception. They have some, we call it an unfair advantage. They have some unfair advantage to be the one solving that problem, either because they felt that customer problem themselves and therefore they deeply understand it, maybe a family member or they've worked in that industry. The reason why I obsess over the problem is that I'm investing in the early stage. So the product that they are showing me, sometimes there's not even one yet, but even their construct of the, pro of the product that is not going to be the thing that's going to change the world or make me a lot of money. What's going, it's going to iterate and change over and over. But if they understand the customer problem and they deeply understand it and have mechanisms to continue to understand the problem and they quickly are iterating their product, I see that they have both a learning orientation and this process by which they can iterate and ship their product quickly. That for me is the winning combination. And so when they show me this product in front of them, I actually think of it not as I'm investing in this product, but that what they're showing me is a proxy for their thinking mm -hmm. and their design sensibilities. And so if they can say, this is the problem and this is the version of the solution I'm showing you, I'm actually kind of looking at their tinkering mind and their solution mind, not actually at the product itself. And then I'm looking for how do they continue to keep their finger on the pulse of the customer problem? How do they get their customer feedback and how quickly can they turn that into a product or a service? So I really over-index on that. And that's my special sauce is really being able to say, this person understands the problem. Kylie, when she's meeting the founder, she over-indexes on founder dynamics, which is also a very important ingredient of success or failure. And founder breakups is usually the number one reason why companies will ultimately fail. And so she has a secret sauce of being able to understand what is the dynamic between co-founders, how do they work, how do they fight, how do they divide and conquer. And so those are the two things that we are looking at while going through kind of what anyone would do in normal due diligence of understanding the problem space, understanding the competitive landscape, understanding the regulatory environment or, you know, trends. Anyone can do that. But I think where we are, I would say, a little exceptional is on those two things, understanding the customer problem space and understanding those founder dynamics. How long is, sorry, how long is the due diligence that you do because I'm just trying to work out, you know, it's so interesting that you say the founder dynamic, you know, how they fight, how they mend um, issues between one another. 
do you have to try and observe that or do you just get them to talk about it? And I guess the due diligence process would be a lot longer if you're waiting to observe it. I mean, you'd be surprised. I could probably tell you about your founder dynamics just from what I observed over breakfast. Oh my God, go. Uh, how we long do we have to we lay down? $250 laying the couch and I'll... She goes, uh, yeah, you're not going to last to the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Let's wrap up this podcast quickly because this isn't going it. No, so you'd be surprised how many subtle cues there are. So um, it's not, we, we don't necessarily ask about it directly, but we say, tell us about how you met. Or tell us about how you, you know, divide and conquer things on the team. And the and we could also say, show us your cap table. We can see how did they divide ownership? How did they divide tasks? How did they divide airtime? When we ask them questions, who answers the question? What percentage of the 30 minutes that we spent together was consumed by one voice over two? So there are lots of subtle cues. And we're looking for inherent trust. We're looking for complementary skills. And we're looking for people who have ideally been through something hard together and have gotten through the other side. So you ask how long the due diligence process is. It's anywhere from five minutes to two years. Uh, five minutes is, you know, we see, like I, like you mentioned, somewhere up to a thousand companies a year. So sometimes it's a quick flick through an email or a deck and we know that it's not right for us. Then usually if it, we think it's something that we want to learn more about, we have a 30 minute coffee chat. Thank goodness those have moved to Zoom. I used to be very caffeinated. Now I just get to sit at home and have back-to-back -back Zooms. And then if there's something more that we want to learn, usually we go into due diligence. Either they have a data room or we start to do research ourselves. I'm doing DD on a company right now. I had one 30-minute meeting, 30 meeting with them two weeks ago. I had a product demo Yesterday, today I'm meeting with an expert and on Monday I'm meeting with an expert to understand this space. And on Wednesday, we'll then have a weekly daily, um, a weekly deal flow meeting where we decide this is going to go forward into due diligence. Now, how long you have also depends on whether they're actively raising right now. So sometimes we always are meeting companies and if they're not actively raising, that's an opportunity for us to get to know them slowly over time. Or if they're amazing, we kind of convince them to raise. We convince them to take some of our money right now. But there are lots of companies that I meet and I'm like, you know, it's not right now, but I want to, I actually want to continue to get to know you and let's check in every fortnight or let's check in every two months. And I have a bunch of companies that literally I've been checking in with over the course of one or two years, waiting to see if they've landed on something that's investable. And it's really cool to build that relationship, to see how they progress over time, to see how they shift their thinking, how they come at the problem differently. But also sometimes, you know, if it's an active raise and they're like, listen, term sheets are in next week, we're closing this round by two weeks, like we have to move very quickly and we're extremely nimble and flexible and able to move very quickly. Likewise, if we have time, we will, you know, use the luxury of that time. So it really does depend. And I, it sounds like a throwaway line between five minutes and two years, but I have plenty of examples of deals that we've made where I've known the founders for years. So you're probably one of the best people in Australia to answer the question on what is the difference between VCs in America versus VCs here? What's the startup culture like in Australia versus the startup culture in America? Yeah. You've lived both lives. I have. And I, um, it's been really exciting. I've been here in Australia for the better part of, gosh, 14 years now. I came in 2009. And so it's been so amazing to see how the startup ecosystem has grown and evolved during that time, just in sheer order of magnitude, just the number of companies, so a quantity perspective, but also quality, how many folks who had experience working for startup successful companies in the U.S. or overseas have come back, you know, the boomerangs who are coming back and bringing their skills and their expertise. You know, my friends like, you know, Nick Crocker, who's now a partner at Blackbird, or James Tynan, who's a partner at SquarePeg, you know, those were both folks who are Australian, went to the U.S., worked for startups, and now are bringing that experience here. So there's a whole bunch of um, talent that have come home, usually when they are having children. And Australia is the best place in the world to raise kids. So we have that advantage going for us. But also, I mean, just so much has changed here in the amount of private capital that's being mobilized, still nowhere near as much as more mature ecosystems, but that has grown just the number of funds. You're talking about LPs, like there's, is it harder to get money from LPs here? 
Well, I just think and I'm LPs, actually sorry. LPs being as well. If you can just explain what an LP yeah, is. Yeah, LP as well. is a limited partner. That's someone who's putting their money into a fund. So there's someone like me who deploys that capital. So I find the great companies and I put that money to work. But there are people who are giving me that money, and that is an incredible honor and responsibility um, to be the custodian of people's capital. So. I was at first celebrating that so much more money has been mobilized here in Australia in the last 15 years. We still need more on a per capita basis. And the stats that get thrown around, which are old, but then I re-ran the numbers and they're actually still holding, is about $3 per capita is deployed into early stage companies here in Australia versus about $25 per capita in the US. So just a lot more money. And everyone's like, well, that's a bigger market. But like that now is adjusted for size. Mm. And so America is just investing more in that entrepreneurial environment. So does that make, I feel like that has two different dynamics then, because it would make it harder for Australian companies to raise money in Australia because there's less money, but it would make it easier for you to get the deals you want because there's less money you're competing with and you would get better valuations. Yeah, that so the valuations is a separate thing. I'll put that to the side, but you are right in that the competition is just a lot less here. And also because we're still in a nascent ecosystem, there's a lot of collaboration between investors. We're a co-investor by strategy, so we've co-invested with over 25 funds throughout Australia and the world. Um, and so we're, we're very strategic in both our check size and how we behave so that the funds are kind of bringing us in. Um, it's a great way to get deal flow, and it's a great way for us to ensure that our companies have deeper pockets than what we can provide. But in the U.S., which is a much bigger ecosystem, there's a little bit more pointy elbows. People are boxing other folks out of the round. So right now, it's a not to say there's no competition here, and I'd like to say that where there is competition, Flying Fox, we tend to do quite well in getting into those deals, um, but it is much more collaborative here. So, yes, the fact that there aren't as many investors in this space does work to our advantage, one, in that people know who we are um, and that we're able to get in on those rounds. So, yeah, that might change. And that's one of the things that I've been telling my investor friends in the U.S. I say, come look at Australia. The valuations are relatively lower. It's less of a frothy market and it's less competitive. You'll be able to get into great deals that not all of your peer firms in the Bay Area are fist fighting over. Like, this is proprietary deal flow. So, um, especially... Why, why don't the big firms have offices here? So, there are different times where they've been really active. 2021 was a good time. There were lots of international firms. And, you know, Mr. Yum was one of those um, investments that you mentioned. And Tiger Global came in um, and invested in, in, the in that company at the time in 2021. So, in 2021, first of all, everything was very frothy, which just means, like, uh, overheated, I'd say, like very- A lot of cash <laughs> a everywhere. A lot of cash. The joke was due diligence is done at the first board meeting. You know, like <laughs> the speed at which decisions were made um, was probably a bit reckless in some instances. And so that's where we got a lot of international funds hunting here because they just needed new hunting grounds. They were running out of places to put their money and running out of companies that they had to, you know, that they didn't want to compete so hard for. So that was an exciting time. Obviously, 2022 is a different story. And so some of those firms have retreated a bit. But in the last couple of months, I've been chatting with funds from around the world who are excited about Australia. Again, just yesterday, I was on the phone with a firm in Singapore, and they are very excited about Australia. So I think, you know, things will just normalize out. But I think global funds who have a mandate for B2B SaaS companies, um, that are able to serve a global market, if they're not looking in Australia, they're missing out on a big opportunity. Rachel, why do you want up more money here? It sounds like it'll be hard. <laughs> you'll start getting more competition, you'll miss out on deals. Listen, I think that a rising tide lifts all boats. And I think more money or more talent or more options just lifts the whole ecosystem. So first of all, it'll force me and my peers to lift our game. Like I'm not scared of competition. Like that'll just make me be better for in a sports analogy, you don't want to be playing in a shitty league. You'd much rather be playing in a hard league and that will lift your game. So, you know, bring it on. I want us to continue to lift our game. The more money's here, it will be uh, a more attractive place for founders to build. And so they won't piss off to overseas ASAP 
or they'll be more incentivized to start something when they know that there's capital and high quality capital available. Um, and so like, yeah, this is, it would be to our detriment across the board if we wanted to stay isolated and stay small. If we want to be on a global stage and play at that quality, we need to bring quality players to the to the field. So I say bring it on. And then, of course, also, I'm an early stage investor. I try and go in in those earliest rounds, follow on maybe one or two checks afterwards. But my companies need downstream capital and my founders deserve choice. And so I want more choice, more high quality investors here so that my companies have the capital they need to grow and scale, but more importantly, that they have the choice, that they're picking the right partner for their journey. This is a 10 to 15 year relationship they're building with their investors. They deserve to pick the right partner. How does a founder then, we've got a lot of very incredible um, operators listen to this podcast and they'll have some ideas and they'll want to go to market and pitch and raise money. How do they first get a meeting with you? And second, how do they actually get you to, to invest in them? Yeah. So again, this has to be a partnership that works and chances are it will outlast the average Australian marriage. So it's less about kind of getting me to invest. It's more about like, let's find the perfect match. There's no point in me telling someone how they need to show up and then for us to have a disingenuous, you know, connection. So like the first thing is you have to absolutely be yourself. You need to deeply understand what it is that you're trying to solve. And then you need to talk to as many people, you know, kiss all the frogs until you find your VC princess or prince, because it's about finding that right match. Again, like I told you what I look for, if a founder is able to articulate, why does this problem matter? Why are they unfairly advantaged in being able to solve it? And what are the ideas or the traction or the uh, progress they've made so far in being able to solve that problem? And how big could this be? Then that's very exciting. And then the thing that I'm always looking for is why me? Like, why am I the right person to be putting this money in, in this at this time? You know, I get a lot of incredible founders, for example, bringing me retail products. And there's a world in which I'm like, man, I can see this making a lot of money. I can see this being really successful. I don't know anything about this space and this product. So one, I'm not your right partner, but also from an opportunity cost of my capital, I'm better off putting that money in a company that I really understand that I can help bend the arc of that company's trajectory. So it's not always also that you're not awesome. It's that you have to find your right match. So what should founders be doing is you have to do your homework. So look at the world of who's out there, who's deploying capital. Look at who has been investing in your space. You know, look at their portfolio pages. Talk to other founders to find out, do they invest in this space? And are they good people? Are they smart? Are they adding value? Or at the very least, not destroying value? Like, just are they not messing shit up? Like, that is basics. Before you come to me, ideally, you've done your homework so that you know, one, I'm likely to invest in this space to you believe that we are likely to be good partners. And then it's about, you know, kind of going deeper and, and trying it on for size. So I always tell people two things. One, founding a company and funding a company is a choose your own adventure. There's no one way to do this. And we're just talking about VC. We're not the only show in town. There are other ways to get capital. And many companies are growing incredibly successful companies that are bootstrapped, meaning taking no uh, growth capital like ourselves. So one, this is not the only way to grow a company. And two, there are lots of different VCs in town. So make sure that you're picking the right ones for you. And if you're a founder, I've been on both sides of the table. I've raised money and I also have a very small fund and I've invested money. And I'd like to hear from you how you would explain to a new founder meeting all the VCs in Australia, raising money, and then they go state, they go to California and they go and raise money or they try and raise money all in the US. What is going to be the difference in appetite, in personalities, in culture of the VCs for founders raising money in both markets? Yeah. And it's, I'm glad you brought us back here because I didn't really answer the question about the difference between the US and Australia. So first of all, I can't use broad brushstrokes because we are all different, right? So like every VC in Australia is different from one to one, like we're not a homogenous group and we all have different theses and different styles and the same thing goes in the US. I'll say 
in general, if I am going to make some generalizations, the U.S., as I mentioned, has a lot more capital to be put to work. And so when you have a bigger pot of capital, it drives two things. One, your risk appetite might be higher. If you have lots of money to throw at something, then you'll be willing to take bigger swings. It doesn't mean that your quality bar drops. It just means things that feel a little bit more outrageous, maybe you'll throw some more capital at. How does that not mean that your quality bar drops? Because each time you make an investment, and I, I'd like to believe this is true for all investors, you have to believe that there is a chance that this could be insane, insanely successful. It doesn't mean you say like, probability is different from quality, right? So dropping a quality bar is saying, you know, this founder isn't really that sharp and, um, you know, I don't think he's like really thinking big enough and I, I like, I don't think he has what it takes, but this is a good problem space. Let's have a go. That is a, that is a bad investment versus this is an incredible founder. She knows her space inside and out. She has this really outrageous freaking idea about, you know, delivering hamburgers with rockets. Like who knows if that's going to happen, but if anyone can figure out hamburgers and rockets, it's this woman. That is very different. That is high risk appetite, mm -hmm. high quality bar. The other one is actually that thing that they're solving is pretty inevitable, but this guy who's running is kind of eh. So I think that all investors, if they're worth their salt, are keeping a quality bar high, but if you have more money, you can throw out some more moonshots. The second is when you have more money, you need to um, deploy it in like bigger chunks as well. And so if you look at the average fund size in America, it's much bigger than the average fund size here. And so you have to get a bigger check out. And when you put out a bigger check, usually we use percentages. So like, let's say the average round, an investment is worth 20% of the overall company taking a big, you know, one fifth of the pizza pie. Um, if you're throwing a bigger check out there, then the overall pie has to get bigger. So that means the valuation is coming up. This is also why valuations are relatively lower in, than the U.S. here in Australia. And so what you're seeing then in the U.S. is bigger round sizes, bigger valuations, and a little bit more of a risk appetite. Now, who knows if that makes them better or worse? And in fact, like right now, some of those funds on paper returns aren't They're exactly... They're getting fucked. Yeah, that's the technical term. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, only time will tell. And that's the problem with VC is we have like a... 10 year long feedback cycle. So time will tell which funds performed better or worse. And that's because you invest in a company now and you don't know if that company's going to zero or a hundred yeah. for about 10 years. Take 10 years to figure that out. 10 years is where you get the liquidity window. So yeah. the truth is you probably know in three to four years, in years five to seven, you really know. And then in year seven to 10, you're finding a way to get your money out, hopefully 10 times to 100 times larger than what you put it in. So that's the thing is that right now, or up until now, a lot of VC performance here in Australia was on paper. And only now are we starting to hit those liquidity windows because the this vintage of funds here in Australia started in 2012. So that means we're now at that 10-year mark, 13 in some instances. Um, and so we're starting to see funds exiting out of those companies and returning money to their investors. So those companies were soaring five years ago. We just weren't pulling the money out. Mm. So yeah, it's about a 10-year cycle. So that is the difference. And that's when, when founders come to Australia and they're like, you know, oh, Australian VCs, you're so much more conservative. In America, they're just throwing money. We'll see if that's a good thing or a bad thing. And I don't think it's because we as investors think differently individually. It is the structural function of how much capital and the um, how we manage those assets that are slightly different to the U.S. So in summary, Australian VCs have less money and more time to deploy it. And so, therefore, they can be more patient and more discerning. Um, we don't well. We don't necessarily have more time to deploy it. In that, most funds have a three to four year window where you need to get the money out the door. And actually, some of our big funds here in Australia are starting to feel that pressure because, like this last year, has been a little slow. They probably raised in twenty twenty one when everything was you know frothy. They probably haven't gotten half the money out the door. And so actually we're going to see a lot of money start to be mobilized this year because we had a slow year last year. So we have the same amount of technical time. Um, but if you mean on a per deal basis, 
Sometimes we have the luxury of a longer DD process because we don't have competition breathing down our neck. Now in 2021, the frenzy in the US was the same here in Australia. We're all moving fast. We're all deploying capital very quickly. Um, I'd say, that, yeah, just the, the bigger, the biggest difference is in the US, just how much money there is, how much choice. There are so many more funds. But um, the US investors now want to see the, a company that has the bulk of their customers based in the US. And that means that if you're an early stage Australian founder and you don't have your customers in the US, they're probably not interested in you. They'll wait. They'll wait. So investor, the concentration for investors has changed. That's why they're deploying less money that, than they did in 2021 now. Like what is the big difference as to why less money is being deployed? Oh, everyone just kind of freaked out because the sky started falling. So 2021, we were at the headiest highs. And then in 2022, it was a mix of macro factors. You know, we had interest rates and inflation. Um, we had, you know, instability with geopolitical things. And then really what happened was the IPO market just kind of shut. Just the companies. IP the IPO market is? That's when um, startups float on a stock exchange. So in America, that's usually the New York stock, stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. That's when a private company becomes public. And that's when investors, that's one way in which we make our money back. So we've put in all of this money. We wait and wait and wait. You grow up, you're huge. You go ahead and list as a public company. And when those public investors, mom, pop, anyone buys those shares, the investors get their money back. When the IPO market shuts, that means companies aren't going public. There's no way for us investors to have any liquidity. And so it means that every, if you think about it, like a train all of a sudden stops all the trains behind it back up. And so that meant then there wasn't a lot of money being put into growth capital because you put money into like pre-IPO because you know there's going to be an IPO in two years. If there's not going to be an IPO in two years, I'm not putting my money in. And then if there's not going to be pre-IPO money, then growth capital shows. So we're starting to see a slowdown all down the track. Now, where I play in super early pre-seed and seed, there was still action happening because we need to keep that kind of continuous birth rate going. Um, and so there wasn't a big change in what we saw. We just saw the valuations come down, which was great. It meant that we were still seeing great companies, still making the same number of investments. The amount of money we got out the door was slightly smaller because the deal sizes and the valuations were less, but it meant we got more for less money. So it it was and it continues to be an outstanding time to be an early stage investor. Does that make it a bad time to start a company or a good time to start a company? Great time to start. This because would be all the capital would be going to early stage now. It's not in growth money. That's right. So if you're starting a company, now's the time. Now is the time. And you would hope by the time you need those Series A, Series B in like three years, things will loosen up. We're already starting to see things loosen up. And we just had a great IPO with Instacart. So like the market is back open again. Um, not in its, you know, full 2021 form, but it's, it, you know, the trains are leaving the station slowly. We're clearing that backlog. An outstanding time to start a company. I think the best time in 15 to 20 years to be investing in early stage. And I say that I get, I guess at my detriment, everyone will kind of flood that market. Alternatively, you want to invest through us, you're always welcome. <laughs> and, and, my, and my experience as well is that it's actually easy to hire now because all of the big tech guys are making shitload of redundancies and and so you're not competing for talent as hard. So if you're starting a company now, it's easier to find that technical co-founder or it's easier to find, you yeah. know, people to help you build. Absolutely. And we talk about that a lot um, in the last two years is that this has been a great recycling of talent. Like you said, big companies reducing their team size. And it also some of the um, even the larger startups that are kind of in that IPO window and those IPOs aren't going to materialize people who've been sitting there with their golden handcuffs waiting for the IPO because of their employee stock are just saying, you know what, it's probably not worth as much as I thought it was going to be. My switching cost isn't as great. I actually love the early stage. I want to build zero to one again. And so we're seeing, you know, big fang. So those are like the big tech company employees are coming back to startup land, more advanced uh, or like larger startup folks are coming back into early stage. And this is what we need. We need that know-how, that experience to be cycled back. And so uh, at Flying Fox, we tell our founders all the time, like now is the time you should be shopping for talent. It's There's never been a better time. You seem very value and purpose driven. It seems like everything that you do is 
has this intention around it. Uh, and it seems like that's what you seek in the founders that you work with. And that's how you advise your founders as well. But I'm interested to know what is that value and purpose? What are those values that you have that kind of are your North Star? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'll, I'll tell you about my values, but the reason why it's important, not that people share my values, but people are driven by value and purpose is that this shit is hard. And the startup journey is long, you know, at least 10 years in many cases. Um, it is not easy. You know, it's described always as a roller coaster of the highest highs and the lowest lows. And so if you are doing this for a quick buck or you're doing this because you see a market opportunity, but you don't have a sense of passion or values around why you're doing it, it's going to be pretty hard to endure that roller coaster ride. So I think that's why it's so important. And then likewise, I'm a founder myself of a VC firm this shit is really hard, you know, and it was hard in 2021 when we were scrambling to get money out the door. And it's hard in 2022 when we're trying to raise in what is considered the toughest capital environment in 15 years. And so we also need to have a higher purpose to what we're doing. And so Kylie and I, um, we have our individual values that we brought to the firm. And then of course we have firm values that we share. Uh, I'll talk about mine personally. And the reason I do this is I have I have two kids. They're 12 and they're eight. We live here in Australia. At the risk of being sentimental, I'm like unbelievably grateful that I get to call Australia home. I was born and raised in the States and it's a great country in many ways, but that is not a country that I want to live in right now. And it's not a country I want to raise my kids in and send them off to school in. And instead I get to be here in this beautiful country that is unbelievably safe and relatively prosperous. And I just feel indebted. I feel indebted to this country that I owe, I owe it to leave it in as best of a condition as I can. One, that it's given me this gift. And then also I want my kids to be able to inherit a country and an economy that is built on things of the future, not things of the past. And if they want to join or build an incredibly, you know, progressive and innovative company, I want them to be able to do that here in Australia and not have to go overseas to build it, to fund it, and to, you know, fill it with incredible talent. And so for me, there's no better way to do that through unlocking all of the resources we have here, all of the talent and um, the know-how to make Australia a prosperous nation built on innovation and technology. So that's what motivates me day to day. On the little, on like a smaller scale, there is no greater privilege than to work day in, day out with people who are waking up every morning to work on their life's purpose. Like that is incredibly inspiring. Even if it's not my life's purpose to make, you know, um, a software layer that connects musicians with venues, although like I'm super passionate about that, that's surreal. But even if that's not my life passion, those three founders, Jeremiah, Alan, and Brandon, they wake up every day and that is their life's work. Do you know what it feels like when I'm just surrounded by hundreds of founders who are doing their life's work and therefore I believe I'm doing my life's work? It's just, it's an incredible way to be rather than, you know, walking into a big bank and you see everyone's just kind of punching in, punching out. And so I'm motivated because of what we're building together for the world and for Australia. And I'm motivated because I get to work with passionate people who are doing their life's work. And I'm motivated by, you know, whatever legacy that leaves for my kids and my my family. I imagine that you parent your children and I don't want to assume, but quite differently to how you were parented, it seems like there's this limitless possibility feeling in yeah. what you teach. Listen, I was very lucky. I had incredible parents um, growing up who gave me a ton of opportunity and instilled in me ambitions to succeed uh, and to perform. Um, but it was, in some instances, um, a pretty set uh, version of what success is. So I was, you know, my father was a doctor, his father was a doctor. There was a, a, a pretty clear idea that success usually was financial and academic. I was rewarded when, you know, I was top of my class or I went to Stanford and um, went into lucrative jobs. I have this quirky side to me where growing up I loved music, I loved film, and I was told very early on that 
as uh, exciting as those hobbies were, that is not where I was going to invest any real time and energy. And I Jokes on them, you invest in that stuff now. Yeah, that's but right. But also not jokes on them because without them and without that drive that they install, instilled in you, you wouldn't be where you are now. Yeah, and actually I have an incredible coach who said, while they taught you how, because I was taught to chase after the carrots, right? I was very reward driven and um, very type A. So I wanted to perform. I got the carrot. I nibbled it. I got went to the next one. Um, and so it wasn't a very creative path that I was charting in my early days. And my coach helped me to see, like, that might not serve you now, but look where it got you, right? And so it's gotten me with a network, with resources, with skills, uh, with lessons learned, incredible education. You know, I have a degree from Stanford and two degrees from Columbia, like, incredible, like, all of that type A behavior has gotten me great things. Now, I can recognize what parts of it don't serve me, and I can mirror or share those lessons with my kids. So I have two very different children. I have a son who's very technical, very academic. He's actually very financially motivated. He signs his name M-I-L-E dollar sign and has since he was about five. It's my boy. Like financially yeah. motivated or yeah. wants to be a hip-hop star? I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Like <laughs> so, you know, and then I have a daughter who is not academic. She's unbelievably creative. She is really in tune with people and babies and animals. And so it's actually this great lesson for me to be like, okay, universe, I see what you're doing. You're giving me my opposite and you're mm -hmm. testing me on how to celebrate what success looks like for very different human beings. My daughter is only eight, but she already says I'm not going to university and whatever job I'm going to have isn't going to require a university degree. And at first I was like, oh, you know, <laughs> this is my Stanford alumni. Like this is my future Stanford graduate. And now I look at her and I'm like, she's totally right. And she's probably the kind of kid like, Maybe she shouldn't even finish high school. Like, maybe we should just go live in Paris together. Like, she's fucking amazing, but in a very different way. And then likewise, my son, he's unbelievably entrepreneurial. I actually, don't, I don't think I want him going to university. Like, university kind of sucks now. Like, I want him starting a company. I would much rather take that tuition money, be his seed investor, and watch this kid grow an empire. So it's been really cool for me to, one, have two di very different kids, um, which challenges me to flex my parenting, um, to see the world very differently to the world that I was um, shown as a, as a kid, and to just care first and foremost about their happiness and just know the rest will kind of will come to be. Mm, I love that. First and foremost, their happiness. Amazing. Rachel, what's the biggest mistake you've made as an investor? Ah, oh, shit. How long do we have? <laughs> Listen... I'll tell you the mistakes, what aren't mistakes. And that is... If uh, I hang thought, on, that was the question. <laughs> well, I'll, like there have been some really dud investments, you know, that aren't playing out. But that doesn't mean I made a mistake because you need to just... The biggest mistake is if you don't show up to the game and you don't get at the plate. Mm -hmm. If you keep swinging and, you know, you miss a few, that is actually part of the game. And in fact, I'm not going to hit a home run unless I'm swinging for some of those fastballs. So when we make a shitty investment, we do a retro and we just say like, what was it about our thesis when we made this investment that gave us such high conviction that isn't playing out? And what can we learn from that? So the time I'll, I'll tell, like, if we thought that the consumer behavior is going to be different because we were making a big bet on the future, we got that wrong. Like, of course, sometimes we're going to get that right. Sometimes we're going to get that wrong. If we made a mistake because we, and this only happened early, where we were in love with the problem space, in love with the opportunity, and let that sh overshadow the fact that we knew that the founders were not A+, plus, that was always our biggest mistake. And that is the inexcusable mistakes. We can take crazy swings on rockets and burgers. Why do I feel like this might be a company? Because you've mentioned. And it I keep twice. pointing to you. So yeah. I, this is your destiny, Poppy. <laughs> I don't even eat burgers. Yeah. I'm gluten free. <laughs> <laughs> like, I will never say that we failed if we were going for something incredible, and for like market forces or timing or something, it just didn't play out. But if we allowed ourselves to drop the bar, especially on founders, we know better. And so I, of course, won't name names. But when I think about what are the investments that kind of keep me up at night, 
it's when I knew that that founder just didn't have it. But I thought, ah, the problem space is so good. Anyone can succeed here. The problem is, is that B people hire B people or even C people. They create environments that are B and C environments. A plus people will always hire A plus people and they'll create a high performance environment that give them the best shot of solving it or figuring it out. The problem is, is that in that B case scenario, when you have a mediocre person, there are going to be so many things they need to figure out because nothing is a given. And that's where they fall down. They just aren't able to navigate and like constantly reinvent, not the problem they're solving, but like what is the solution that's, or the business model that's going to make sense. And so that's my biggest mistake is where I've allowed the problem space to get me more excited than the founders. And so it's all about the founders now. And answer this as a founder yourself or as an investor. What is the thing you are most proud of? Can I say two things? Please. Look at me, <laughs> dodging the mistakes, but asking for two <laughs> answers on the pride. I, I'm most proud of two things. One, I'm most proud of the partnership that I've built, first and foremost with Kylie and now with Bree and you know with future partners that we bring in. And that is because Kylie and I have built a firm that is so deeply rooted in values around doing the right thing that we always have this North Star and it is not always clear cut what we should do in a given situation. And whenever we go back to first principles, which is what is the best thing, what is the most right thing for us to do in this moment, we always know what the answer is. And so that's what the second part of that is that I believe that we have always acted with integrity, always with transparency, and we have always strived to do the right thing. The right thing for our founders, first and foremost, the right thing for our investors. And sometimes that could be, you know, at our own personal or financial detriment. I think that the VC world can be kind of, it can get kind of dirty sometimes. And I think that especially more in other markets, but here as well, the greed of it can overshadow values. And I think that knowing that I have a partner in Kylie and she and I will always do the right thing when forced to choose. And knowing that our firm is firmly built on that foundation, not only does it make it a great place for me to work every day, but it's attracting the right people to work with us and it's attracting the right founders to be on our journey. Rachel, um, I think I speak for everyone where I think that Australia is super lucky that you call this place home and that you're investing here and you are putting in work, building Australian companies up, Australian founders up. We are so lucky that there is someone with your energy and experience here doing that. And I think you've already started investing in Australian music companies. I have no doubt there'll be many more. And I can't wait to see what the next decade looks like at the end of all your hard work after the, this 10-year fund. I'm pumped about it. I'm very grateful. I'm very inspired. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks, Luke. Thanks, Poppy. It's Thank been a blast. You. Thank you. Cheers.